Good evening. My name is Jim Entz and I am the coordinator of CHAP. Tonight, CHAP, the Cultural Historical Awareness Program, presents Maya Hieroglyphs, The Story of How the Code Was Broken by Dr. Ed Barnhart, director of the Maya Exploration Center. The Porterville College Cultural and Historical Awareness Program, CHAP is the acronym for that, was organized in 2002 to enhance students' awareness of important aspects of our society to which they may previously have had little or no exposure. A theme is chosen by CHAP members every year and faculty members across campus are encouraged to integrate elements of that theme into their coursework. And um, they are also encouraged to encourage their students to come to these events. Mm -hmm. So um, the theme for this year is the Anthropocene. Events such as this with a guest speaker are offered throughout the year and they are free and open to the public. I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Ed Barnhart, a renowned American archaeologist who has appeared on History Channel, Discovery Channel, and in multiple documentary films. He's the director of Maya Exploration Center, a fellow of the Explorer Club, and a widely recognized authority on ancient astronomy, mathematics, and calendar systems. During his over 25 years in American archaeology, he's discovered the ancient city of Maxna in Belize, mapped over 4,000 ancient buildings and published over a dozen articles and books. His research on ancient sciences has taken him to over a dozen countries, including Cambodia, Indonesia, Peru, Bolivia, and Easter Island. Through the teaching company's great courses, he's produced four video courses, including 104 lectures on subjects within the topic of ancient American civilizations. His most recent projects are an eight-part travel show for Wondrium named Exploring the Mayan World and a podcast called Archaeoed. Here uh, is Dr. Barnhart. <laughs> Well, hello. Let me put on these glasses. I don't need them, but I can't see without them. Uh, hopefully I've got this right. Thank you for inviting me to your lovely community. I've never been to this part of the world, and it was really nice to drive in here. You live in a lovely place. <laughs> um, so tonight I'm going to talk about Maya hieroglyphics and how the code was broken. Um, it was a long road, and I'm going to tell you the story of the personalities that went along with it, and uh, at the end, prove a little bit that we actually do know what we're talking about, that we can actually translate these things. So, how I'm involved in the person that was probably the real catalyst to breaking the code was this woman, Dr. Linda Sheely. She was my teacher. She died tragically in 1998 of pancreatic cancer at the age of 54, which is how old I am now. And uh, I miss her all the time. But she was the organizer in 1973 uh, of a dynamic group of people that met in Palenque, Chiapas, Mexico, and finally broke the code that started us on the path to what we know today. And uh, my mapping project at Palenque was actually the very last thing Linda funded. So uh, she's, she's really the reason I'm standing here today. <clears throat> so to start off with, writing. Where would we humans be without it? We've been writing each other's messages for really, you know, my slide here is actually a little outdated. I say 30,000 years ago. Now we can say that writing's so old, it's older than humans. We've actually found Neanderthal writing now in certain caves in Spain. So we've been using this as an important communication device forever. So even though over the course of human history, we've had now really hundreds of written languages that have come and gone, there are really only five that we recognize as original writing scripts that the rest of them came from. And those are up here. Let's see, do I have a, do I have a little pointer thingy? Mm, probably not. But it is uh, Sumerian, 
which is cuneiform, Egyptian, Chinese, Harappan, and then Maya, or we could broadly say Mesoamerican, because we're actually, we, we've, we've excavated a fraction of Mesoamerica. It's entirely possible that either the Zapotec or the Olmec ultimately will be proved to be the ones that are the, uh, the, the first to start this language. A funny one is Harappan. Of these five here, Harappan is actually about to get kicked off the list because we still haven't broken that code. The other four we have pretty well, but Harappan scholars are beginning to gang up on it and say that, okay, maybe it is just a really elaborate symbol system because we haven't broken it yet. So it may, we may get down to four here soon. One that I think is actually going to be added to the list one of these days is the Inca Kipu. And that's a knotted string system that we know that they were encoding all sorts of complicated information. We, we can do the accounting kipus now. We can tell ones that are math, but we can't read the other ones. But they could, and they had whole libraries of these things. Now we have about 900 of them left on the planet. That's one of the problems of breaking the code, that we don't have enough of them to actually see the variation. And there's also the problem of linguists who have a kind of unfair definition, I think, that if a language doesn't reflect human speech, that it's not a written language. I think that's an unfair uh, standard that it's being kept to. But I would predict that hopefully before my lifetime, we're going to actually break the Inca code and we will add Kipu to one of the original languages, written languages, written. That one's knotted. So, you know, comparing cuneiform, which is admittedly the very first ever language uh, written down to Maya hieroglyphics. Now, you know, I'm, I'm team Maya, but uh, even though cuneiform is much older, I would say that, that is, that's literally chicken scratch. Look at the Maya hieroglyphs. It is definitely the most elegant of all these ancient languages ever created. It's really, we're beginning to call it rightfully a, uh, a form of calligraphy. So here's a comparison of these two. The Mesopotamians also used clay tablets. So we've ended up retaining those archaeologically. We have tens of thousands of clay tablets. And importantly, we have like bad math and terrible poems and all sorts of really human things in the Mesopotamian scripts where the Maya invented fanfold books and since they lived in the jungle virtually all of them are gone. Today we have four maybe five Maya books in existence. We also have their carved monuments which helps and we have things like this picture is actually uh, off of a, it's a black and white off of a ceramic vase found in a king's tomb. And you can see the glyphs going across the top. So here's one of those fanfold books. This is the Madrid Codex. We have the Madrid, we have the Paris, we have what used to be called the Grolier, but it was just given back to Mexico and now it's the Maya Codex. And then we have, uh, we have the Paris, Madrid, and the Madrid, Paris one. What's my fourth co codex? The Dresden. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I can't believe that's the coolest one. I can't believe I blanked on that. Thank you. <laughs> um, so how did we break this code? Really, this individual who is uh, infamous for this auto de fe he did where he burned hundreds of Maya books, he's actually the one that gave us what turned out to be informs the Rosetta Stone that helped us to, uh, to break the code. He was so brutal to the Maya. Not only did he burn books at Mani, he actually burned people. He was such a mad dog zealot about converting the Maya that conquistadors ratted on him to the Spanish crown and said, this guy is really crazy. And you know when conquistadors think you're too violent, you're really <laughs> off the chain. So this guy got sent back 
to, ser to in jail in Spain. And while he was in jail and waiting for his trial, he wrote this book called Relation of Things in Yucatan. And within that book, he had a alphabet that he extracted from one of his, uh, one of his uh, informants. He actually won his trial and came back and was the first bishop of Yucatan. But this is the page out of the book I'm talking about. <clears throat> this right here is that alphabet. He just said to his informant, put an ah right here, put a be right here, put a se, put a de in Spanish. And the informant heard the sound and he wrote the symbol that was that sound. So now like this one we know is A-H and be is B-E right here, be, there's a little footprint on a road, be is road. And he, they just went through this game and he wrote what he thought was an alphabet. Actually it was a... Uh, vowel consonant sounds that the person was writing down. But a really funny thing was up here, before he did this, he said, write a sentence into my book right here, and now we can translate that sentence, and it says, I don't want to. <laughs> so we, can, we, we know what kind of relationship he was having with this individual. <laughs> but anyway, that becomes a key, but not for a while. The first time we actually see, or that Europe gets to see Maya hieroglyphs is because of Alexander von Humboldt. He publishes as one of his many volumes about things all about the Americas. He was a naturalist, but he was kind of a jack of all trades. He was in all sorts of things. He published a few pages out of the Dresden Codex in one of his volumes showing off things in 1810. And so that was the first time that people got to see hieroglyphs like this. But they had no idea where they were from. These books showed up to uh, Europe, and then their context was lost. But he recognized them as part of the Americas, and he put them in the book. One of the first people who actually productively used it was this man, Constantine Samuel Rufineski. He's actually a botanist, but he was also a guy that dabbled in all sorts of things. And actually, uh, personality-wise, he was pretty abrasive. He was a little guy who knew everything about everything. And he was one of those people that no matter what you thought you knew, he knew more. So he was actually, uh, among his community, known as kind of irritating. <laughs> but he uh, dabbled in this as well. And he's the first guy to publish and say, look, these dots and bars, these are numbers. So he identified, looking at the thing that Humboldt published, that a dot is one, two, three, four. When you get to four dots, it turns into a bar. So here, a dot and a bar is six and onward. And he also identified that they don't use a base 10 system like we do. They use a base 20 system. So this was important. At least when people were looking at these, now we knew that these were numbers and that they were counting things and we began to suspect that there were actually dated pieces of information on Stila and in books. Rufineski, by the way, he was, uh, he was an Americanist as well, an American <coughs> botanist, and the poor guy, he collected an entire lifetime worth of plants and he was really brilliant at his job and then had them all put on a boat to go back over to France and to write up everything, and that boat with all of his life's work sunk. Uh, he, he was a brilliant guy. We probably would be way farther ahead in botany had his boat not sunk. But he did help us out in, our, in my archaeology. So another big turning point was John Lloyd Stevens. Uh, Stevens and Catherwood did these incredible adventures. Uh, I've got a typo there. That's 1841, sorry. I always look for these typos. I don't see them until I'm standing in front of the crowd. <clears throat> 1841 is Incidents of Travel in Central America and Yucatan. It's a two-volume thing, actually a great adventure story if you've never heard of it. It's, it's a fun read. But Stevens was actually the ambassador to what was going to become the nation of Central America. And his job really was to go down there and try to figure out which one of these petty uh, 
warlords or you know, dictators of each one of the countries should be the one that the United States should back as the president of Central America. Now, that never happened. That never got together. To this day, there's still these nations and not a collective nation like they wanted to be back then. But Stephen's real passion was these ruins. So he used his position, actually, to go through and look at all these ruins. And he brought Frederick Catherwood with him, who made these incredible drawings, very, very accurate drawings. To this day, you can see more of the hieroglyphs in some of his drawings than we can now because of acid rain and erosion. Some of his drawings are actually keys now. But when his, ver his book became a bestseller, and then people connected those things that Humboldt had put in his book to these Maya monuments standing in the ruins and connected the two and said, oh my gosh, those books are actually Maya script. <clears throat> so by the turn of the 20th century, all these clues were put together and we broke the Maya calendar system. We figured out that they were actually uh, depicting dates, historical dates, or at least that they were talking about time. And that was mostly done by Eric Thompson, and really a lot of the work was done by Salinas Morley, but Eric Thompson was really the driving force. And honestly, he was kind of a bully. He was like six foot four, really strong, strapping guy, and a very, uh, red-blooded American. He was really uh, against uh, Russia and their things as time went on, and uh, he led the field. In fact, Morley here actually suggested in a paper in like the 1930s that he thought that Maya hieroglyphs reflected human speech and that we could break the code, and Thompson publicly called him an idiot in print and Morley apologized and agreed he was an idiot. Oh, no. <laughs> 20 years later, a Russian guy did break the code. And it should have been Morley, but Thompson barked him down. So, but Thompson did a lot of good things too, like this calendar correlation. In the 1940s, he not only figured out how they were devising and, and uh, recording dates, but he correlated it to the Christian calendar. And, but he was convinced that the rest of the glyphs were just what he called esoteric time worship. As he understood the calendar, he rightly did see that some of the dates were going back as much as five million years. And he thought, well, this, this must be, they, they must be obsessed with time and that all these things are about time. So he went to his grave not believing that we could ever break the code. And he controlled that field until the 1960s, really the 70s. <clears throat> but as he was busy saying that we couldn't break the code, there were people that were putting together pieces of the puzzle, like Heinrich Berlin. He was an explorer that was going around to all these sites and recording and, and taking photos of different monuments at different sites. And he recognized that each one of the sites had a glyph that ended their texts that was the same glyph, but only at a certain site. He'd go to another site and it would be another one, but they'd share elements. The, the important elements were this little, see this little piece here? This is Chul Apo, we now know. Holy Lord of, and then there's the glyph, the emblem glyph for Motul de San Jose. So if you go over here to Machila, you see again, Chul Apo Machila. Some of them are a little trickier to see, like this one's a slightly different kind, but you see the Chul Apo Bonum Pac. Mm -hmm. So he's the one who told us, hey, look, all of these sites have their own individual name. These are probably the names of these cities. Now this person is really the one that rocked Thompson's boat. Tatanya Perskuryakov, Russian-born. This I picked this picture in 1952 because a lot of this is changing in 1952. She was actually hired on to these projects as one of the only women in a very male-dominated field 
because of her work as uh, a reconstruction artist. Over here you see one of her many drawings. But she had a real gift for looking at these ruined buildings that were covered in jungle. She could like put her mind above and draw reconstruction drawings. Very, very good ones. And, uh, and so that's what she was hired to do. This is the site of Piedras Negras where she stayed for months. And basically because, you know, she was kind of isolated at the, the camp, she put herself to the idea of looking at these monuments again. And she figured out something very important. Like Berlin, she was looking for patterns. And what she saw is not only that was there an emblem glyph, but there were also these rows of stela in front of temples that would start, there would be like five or six of them, and somewhere at the start, the early ones, would have a glyph that she identified as birth of that king, and then somewhere in the sequence she'd find ascended the throne, and then at the end of it, death. And so she identified those three glyphs, and she looked at all of the calendars, just like Thompson taught everybody, and she said, these stela groups are bracketing within a 50 to 70 year time period, which is a human time lifespan. And I see repeatedly these three glyphs, one for birth, one for ascending the throne, and one for death. She didn't know how to translate them, but she was absolutely right. And so in, I think, 1960, she wrote a paper called uh, Historical Implications in the Inscriptions in Piedras Negras. And totally right about it. Now we know what those glyphs say. But she had just identified them just from their order. Very brilliant woman. And, and Thompson did not like her at all. He didn't let her paper get very far. In fact, Michael Coe wrote kind of a tell-all book called Breaking the Maya Code. And in it, he gets a letter that Thompson wrote to one of his colleagues. And it was about Titania Perskuryakov. And it said terrible things. It said something like, Poor Titania, withering away in the basement of the Peabody Museum, chain smoking. No one will ever love her and she'll die alone. Like, that was really personal, rotten things. I, I don't like Thompson much for that sort of thing. And, and sadly, you know, she did die alone and her ashes were in the basement of the Peabody Museum for some like 30 years, and finally a good guy named Steve Houston that restarted a project at this place in Piedras Negras took her ashes and we put them right up here. So she's now buried right up there. I, I showed up the year that we put that in there and put a plaque there, so at least she gets to be where she loved. <clears throat> this guy, he's the one who actually breaks the code. Yuri Konorozov. And believe it or not, there are stranger pictures of him. <laughs> He's a, he was a very strange looking man. But he was also very brilliant. And a key thing is that he was locked away from Thompson. Thompson couldn't bully him. He was in Russia. And especially, he, he was uh, a grad student in ancient language studies in Moscow when the Second World War broke out. And he, like every other young Russian, was told to put a helmet on and go to Germany. And so he, among all the other ones, were there. And he was there when Dresden was getting firebombed. And in the chaos of that, and you know the looting and all the sort of things, where did young Yuri go? Well, he ran into the Dresden Library. And he went right to the ancient books section while the place was on fire. And he collected a box and just collected books out of the section that he liked. And by chance, he put in a copy of the Dresden Codex and some dictionaries that were Yucatec things. And so when he got back to Russia and showed it to his grad professor, he said, well, I know what these things are. These are from the Americas, but they've never been broken. The code's never been broken. And you ended up with them. You should give it a try. And so he did, and he actually got these books by weird chance of being in Dresden while the library was on fire. It was kind of fate that this guy picked up these books. But he did what Thompson would have never done, which is to ask the question, what if 
the Maya are still speaking the same language that these hieroglyphs are in. So he goes back to Landa's dictionary, or Landa's alphabet, which really had been just put to the side for now centuries. And he treats it like I was saying. He treats these not as an alphabet, but as sounds. So he uses this, and he goes to the Dresden Codex, and he looks for these sounds, these, these symbols. And so he's, his, his plan was to find images of things that he could say, okay, this is a dog. <clears throat> so can I find the Yucatec Maya word for dog in these symbols above? And he finds one, this one right here, which is this symbol, it's two symbols. And dog is sul, so he predicts this is sul and this is lu. And so then he comes and he finds a turkey. And he says, okay, what's it, what is it? It's kuts. So there's a tsu, there's a tsu. That's the symbol. And that one right there is tsu, and this one right here is tsu. So he proves that these are phonetic sounds reflecting Yucatec. He has a number of other examples other than this, but he really does prove this. But Thompson hates this. Thompson uh, immediately says this is just communist propaganda. And at the time, there were these geopolitical fights where every scholarly paper coming out of Russia said uh, that it had a mandatory preface that said only through the enlightened perspective of Marxism could these truths come to be known. And eventually, the world will know that capitalism was never the way. And, this really pissed Thompson off, so he wouldn't let anybody see this paper. <clears throat> Just like I said there. And he mocked anybody. But then Michael Coe, who was one of the uh, kind of rebel folks from this, he was from uh, Yale. <clears throat> His wife was also Russian born, Sophie Coe, and she could speak Russian. So he had her translate Konorozov's paper and quietly circulated among all of the scholars in the United States in the 1960s. And uh, his book talks about Thompson catching him doing that too, and that was fun. <coughs> Thompson did not like that. And to Thompson's credit, I know I've come off pretty hard on Thompson. He did, on his deathbed, uh, admit that he was wrong. But that was like the late 70s. <laughs> he also did get knighted by the Queen of England, so he's got that going for him. <clears throat> so, finally all these clues are coming together, and that's where Linda Sheely comes in. <clears throat> I love this picture, Linda Sheely and uh, Peter Matthews. Now, Peter Matthews is retired back in Australia where he was born, and a very dignified scholar. I love this picture of him in that mushroom hat like a hippie, because that's what he was back then. <laughs> It was really just a, a group of young hippies that got together and broke this code in the end, which was a funny thing. You can see Sheely was one too. Sheely was not an uh, expert in hieroglyphs. She was a art teacher at the University of Alabama. And her husband was an architect. And her husband was the one who really liked Maya architecture. He thought it was very elegant. And one summer they hatched this plan that they could get enough money to go and see the Maya ruins if they made it a art uh, field trip. So they got a van and like six students, and this was like the, uh, the late 60s, and they drove this van from Alabama down through Mexico, and they were gonna go to Uxmal and Chichen Itza. But the road map that they were following that they bought at the border turned out to be kind of aspirational. They hadn't made that highway all the way yet. They were just planning on doing so. So they got as far as Villahermosa in Tabasco, and there was no more highway. And so they were sitting at their hotel wondering what they were going to do, and they met this traveler who said, well, I'm going to Palenque, and uh, that's a Maya ruins. You guys could go there. So I said, okay. So they followed this guy to Palenque, where Linda met Merle Green Robertson. 
she was doing rubbings with, uh, with rice paper of all of the monuments there. In fact, she had done them all across the Maya world. She was a wonderful woman, died at the age of like 97. I did her 95th birthday party <laughs> at Palenque. So Linda being an artist and seeing this wonderful art, they immediately become fast friends. And she has her students helping Merle the whole week. And they spend the rest of their time at Palenque. And Linda swears, OK, I'm going to come back and help you next summer. And Linda comes back on her own without students. And she's working for Merle. And she gets interested in these hieroglyphs. And she says, you know what? What does all this mean? And Merle says, well, nobody really knows. There are these people that I know that come in and out. And so she kind of introduces Linda to the world of the very few people who are actually looking at this question. Linda's a big, forceful personality. She was like six foot one, cursed like a sailor, had very thick southern accent, and she was, uh, she, she was uh, a wonderful woman, but she was really uh, a force of nature. And so she just called all these people on the phone. Hey, Floyd Lounsbury in Harvard, you should come down to Palenque and talk about these glyphs. And one thing led to another, and she assembled this group of people that were going to meet at Palenque. And they were all young people like her and hippie Peter Matthews that you saw. So they all, and they were all teachers at the time. The only time they really had off was Christmas break. So they all agreed that they would bring their families down on a kind of a trip and, and they would meet at Merle's house in Palenque and they would try to figure out how to crack this code. So that was 1973. And uh, Linda and Merle were part of it. Floyd Lounsbury was the linguist from Harvard, so he was a big deal. There was another guy named Gillette Griffin who was from Princeton, who was the kind of art historian. And then there was supposed to be another guy named David Kelly from the University of Calgary, but he couldn't make it. So he sent his student, Peter Matthews, with a whole briefcase full of pictures of things that he had been figuring out. So this was the group that met at this house. The house was built by Moises Morales. He really loved Merle. And Merle was kind of a, a traveler around the Maya world, and he recognized what a passion she had. And he built her a little house on his land, and that was where they were all meeting. So it was really Moises' house, though everybody called it Merle's house. But Moy turns out to have really changed the moment. There's an important moment that, that Linda Sheely tells. I also heard it out of Moises' mouth. He was, a, he was my neighbor in Palenque for years, and I heard all sorts of great stories from him. But there was this moment where they had this blackboard up and they had identified the name of the king who was in the big famous tomb at Palenque. Now we know his name is Pakal. At the time they were calling him Lord uh, Seven, Seven Ahau, which is his birthday. They had identified the, his calendar name, but not his real name. So they wrote, they, they, they drew this symbol up there. And they could tell that it was a shield because there are other, there are other pieces of art that made it clear that that was a shield that people would hold in battle. So they wrote under it, Lord Shield. And they were talking about how, uh, what that meant. And Moisés speaks up and he says, why are all you gringos giving that Maya king a name in English? And they were like, oh yeah, yeah, you're right, Moisés. We're sorry about that. So they erase it and they put a scudo which is shield in Spanish. And he was like, no, you bunch of Ivy League dummies. I mean, a Maya name. So they look it up and it says Pakal. So they put Pakal up there. And that's when hippie Peter Matthew says, hold on, you remember all those other places that we thought we'd find his name and we didn't? That was the phonetic way to say Pakal. So he's the first one that's the real first thing they do, that there was other places where it said pa, ka, and la. So it was phonetically sounding out his name. And Maya hieroglyphics are very much like this. When, if I asked everybody here to write me a capital A, B, C, there'd be some handwriting differences, but they'd all be the same symbol. 
The Maya loved to change it up. Sometimes they'd use a lobograph that was just like a symbol for the, the shield. Sometimes they would spell it out in these syllables. But this was really the, the key to breaking the code. That, that triggered a whole lot of other readings. And for the first time ever, they took a panel that had no uh, picture to help them figure out what it said, this one, the Tablet of the 96 Glyphs, and they translated it. And once they got those clues in and they started using syllables instead, it took them about 48 hours and they had this whole thing translated. It turns out to be uh, a list of four different kings as part of the dynasty of Palenque. By the way, this, uh, this thing was in perfect shape when it was found. It was not broken up like this. It was a terrible error in archeology. span It was sitting at the base of the tower in Palenque and it was flipped over. And back in the 1950s, they used to take big stones like that and just measure them and then break them up and then get a new one to replace it. So when they broke that one up with the, uh, with the pickaxe and flipped it over, they realized this was on the bottom of it. And they, and they put it all back together. But this, what a tragedy of archaeology. That's, that's the kind of thing that only archaeologists know. We keep it quiet generally. I, I outed my, my community there. We, re, we, we did that. <laughs> <clears throat> so that was a huge moment. In, uh, that, that was when the code was broken. Now one of the people that turned out to be there shortly after was this, this kid named David Stewart. His dad was an archaeologist for National Geographic and he was going uh, deep into the woods of Chiapas that summer, a little bit more than he wanted to bring his son, so he asked Merle and Linda that summer to babysit him if he could stay in Palenque. And so Linda and David spent that whole summer walking around the, uh, the ruins of Palenque and saying, playing the game, you know, what do these say? And so David grew up thinking about this. And when he was 16 years old, he presented this paper to Dunbarton Oaks called 10 Phonetic Syllables in Maya Script. And he actually won the MacArthur Genius Award a few years later for that. He was the youngest recipient of the uh, MacArthur Genius Award ever. But he showed us that a lot of things that people were thinking were logograms, meaning just to, you know, pictures that, that uh, meant whole words, that they were actually big syllables, that the Maya could also exaggerate a statement, like we make it in bold or underline. If the Maya want to make a big statement, they'll make a word go over three blocks by making huge syllables. And so he figured that out at 16 years old because he was palling around with Linda. Now Linda's passed away and David Stewart is actually uh, sitting in the Linda Sheely endowed chair in the University of Texas. Funny how life works out like that. <clears throat> but Linda started something called the Texas Maya Meetings in the 1980s. And this was something special too. So oftentimes, uh, a scholar endeavor like this is very just closed doors, academic pursuits. Linda was never like that. Linda invited the whole world to get excited about it and to be part of it. In my classes when I was with her, she always said, none of you people are ever going to make the paradigm shifting ideas. You've been poisoned by all the books you've read and all the things you've heard from me. It's always going to come from somebody outside with fresh ideas and different eyes, and so we've always got to invite people from all walks of life in to participate, because those are the people that are going to really change the field. So that was always her attitude, and she made these great meetings where anyone was invited to come in. There'd be a basic session where you taught them the basics, and she had a rule that nobody could answer a question to any of those people. Just answer them, give them more information to look at, but don't, don't answer their question. Let them come up with their own ideas. So the Maya meetings really pushed things forward. She got these people from all walks of life to help us figure out how to break the code. <clears throat> so nowadays we have this thing, which we have an alphabet which we use to create all of our written language. The Maya had what we believe, you know, what we call a syllabary. So we have this chart of syllables. So we have the vowels here, 
A E I O U, and then we have the consonants. And so these are like in this block here are all of the glyphs that we know say the sound ba. Here is be. Here is b. Here is bo. Here is bu. So we kind of do the uh, Spanish uh, pronunciations of these things. But if we get over to here, here is ka. K, ki, ko, ku. Here's ka with a with a apostrophe, so it's a glottal stop. I'm terrible at it, but it's like ka versus ka. Like ukaba. Kaba is a name. So you, you get the picture. So we have this thing that we're filling in. And nowadays, you know, we have almost 2,000 uh, carved texts. So and we keep finding more as archaeology goes on. Nowadays, we're in kind of a seesaw moment where we'll find a new panel that teaches us a little bit, but sometimes that panel will teach us that we were wrong about a glyph, and it'll send a shockwave all the way back through all the translations we thought. If we thought something said ko, but now this new one teaches us it's, it's, it's t, then we got to go, oh, God, we were wrong about like 50 words. But we got to go back and figure out what does it mean then? And even then, once we translate these things, just because we can say it out loud doesn't, doesn't mean we know what the hell it says, especially when we're talking about religious texts and uh, poetic people, uh, and the, the sort of things that what they meant just by the words they said. Uh, it's complicated, but we're getting there. So. We call it a logosyllabic script because we have what I just showed you, that syllabary, but then we also know they liked to sometimes put just logographs as things. So, you know, you could spell jaguar as ba la ma, or you could just put a jaguar face. There's pakal, the shield that I was just talking about, and there's a whole set of these, snake, flower. So. We go back and forth between uh, the Maya scribes had uh, an artistic freedom that other cultures' scribes didn't. In fact, they reveled in making their own versions. It was kind of like uh, like jazz music. You know, there's lots of different kinds of music, but jazz revels in uh, variation on a theme. That's how the Maya script was. So when we get to things like uh, like the symbol oo, oo means he, she, it. And because that's in so many sentences, we have like over a dozen different ways that Maya scribes would write oo. So it's it gets to be tricky to translate these things. There's that, that they don't all use the same syllables, and then there's the freedom to use logographs as well. So that's why we call it logosyllabic. <clears throat> but there are clues we use to know how to read these things, like reading order. Just like, uh, just like we read from left to right, there's an order to read a glyph. So first of all, if you have a big panel of glyphs, how do you read from block to block? That's down here. So you've got, you take the top left one, and you go one, two, three, four, five, six. When you get to the bottom of two columns, you go up to the third and fourth column and read down like that. So that's the reading order through sentences of my uh, glyphs. But then in a, in a sign, you have the main sign, prefix, superfix, subfix, postfix. So come over here to this example of Balam. Here is just the logograph, right? If I wanted to just say Balam, which is a pretty common one because every Maya king wanted to call himself Jaguar somebody. <laughs> so you could just go say Balam like this. Or you could say, put the Jaguar head, but then say it starts with the symbol Ba. Or you could say it ends with the symbol Ma. Or you could do both of those. Or you could just totally take out the Jaguar head and that upside down little smiley face is la. So you could say ba, la, ma. So all these different ways are saying the same thing, balam, jaguar. But there are rules of it. So like 
the prefix, you're going to say this one first. The bottom one, you're going to say that one last. So there are some, when we have a complicated block that has five or six symbols in it, we have a roadmap on what order to say which symbol. We also have what Sheely developed to teach students, syntactical analysis. Syntax is just, you know, what order the words go in a sentence, right? We do, what, what do we do? We do subject, verb, object, right? Johnny hit the ball. They do verb, object, subject. So, when we're looking at a long text, basically, the dates are the periods of the sentences. So once you get done with a date, like if this one, when we break it up, there's a long text here. If we break this thing up, right after a date is done, has to be a verb, because that's the syntax of Maya's uh, language. Verb, object, subject. So right after a date, the very next glyph must be a verb. And then the rest of them can be object, subject. So we get to break them up a little bit like that. And the encouraging thing is that Maya hieroglyphs are actually so, just like Thompson said, they really are obsessed with dates and time. And so on a typical Maya text, at least one third or to a half of the whole text is going to be the dates. So if you just get the dates down, then you isolate these little sentences. And you could honestly say, if you just know my uh, uh, calendar stuff, that you could read 50% of all the Maya hieroglyphs. That's encouraging, huh? So here's a text, for example. This one looks really complicated, doesn't it? But it's actually mostly the date. So I'm not going to go through point by point, but I'll give you the gist of it. First off, we have the helpful little image down here. This is a steel of three from Piedras Negras. I love this one in particular because it was really a very male-dominated society. There were queens, but you didn't see them nearly as often as male kings. But this is a rare example where the wife, not the queen herself, there was a king and she was the, the consort. But this particular monument the king put up to his wife and his daughter and her, her face, their faces are a little washed off, but you can see the little daughter here. I like what a tender pose this is, that the mom's sitting there and she's just got her, her knee, her, her elbow on her knee like that. But the text is actually talking all about them. This is, this is that same text blown up. But watch this. This glyph right here, this one just says, here comes the date. We call it the ISIG, the Introductory Series Initial Glyph. Very cumbersome. I don't know who did that. <clears throat> but that first one, that's always there. Then the next five have got to be the long count, the linear count of days. So nine Bach tunes, you see that bar and, and four dots. And then these, those are the five counts of the long count. This one's going to be their sacred calendar. This little piece of information, these glyphs in here, are telling us the age of the moon. It's telling us we're in the second phase of six moons. It's telling us this particular one has 29 days in it. It's telling us its name. And then right here, we finally have the solar calendar date. So this entire thing right here is just telling us what day it is. So like I was telling you in syntactic things, the next glyph has to be the verb. So after all of this whole chunk, there's our verb right there. And that little upended frog face with a uh, ha at the end that says, see ya, was born, lady, you see this little face right here with the bobble on the forehead and looks like an I-L on her cheek? That's the word for lady. That's the glyph for lady. It says Lady Apokatun. So was born Lady Apokatun. So this whole, you've got one third of the text. Really, all of this is just what day it is, and then was born that queen. We go down here, and the same thing. Now we go to a distance number. There's, dis, there's, there's a zero there, a 10 there, a 12 there. 
It's telling us what day to go forward to. And it says a little bit more about what that same queen does. There's her name again. And it says that she's uh, a lord of, of Piedras Negras. Then we get down, look at this glyph right here. These ones are all dates again. This one is the same one as this one. Look at this one and look at this one. See the upturned frog head? And you can see it's even more of an upturned frog head there. And there's that same symbol on the end. That's again, was born the daughter of the queen, Lady, there's the lady thing again, Apo Keen. Her name is uh, Lady Day. And it continues on that way through mostly everywhere where you see a number here, those are all dates. Here they are again. So most of that text is actually the dates. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of it is the queen being born, her daughter being born, and then rituals they do together. And that's how we read these things. Now, the neat thing that Sheely did that I also really loved was it wasn't good enough for her to just uh, invite the general public here in the United States to do it. Every summer, she went down to the Maya world and she shared it with Maya people who were very enthusiastic about it. This is a great picture of her at the site of Utatlan in the highlands of Guatemala. And she, she had her class up on top of one of the temples in the ruins. And uh, this individual here is Federico Fossin. <clears throat> he uh, was the ambassador to Guatemala to the United States for a while. And Linda pulled him into the orbit too and got him all involved. In fact, when she died of pancreatic cancer in 1998, he uh, donated his land at Lake Atitlan for Linda to be buried there. And hundreds of Maya people showed up to her, to her being buried there, and there's still a shrine to her. I think if there's any testimony to uh, Linda's participation in this moment of breaking the code, it's how many Maya people really liked her. She actually, they had a funny name for her. They, you know, the Maya are a small people, and as I said, she was like 6'1 and big. And uh, pardon my French, but the translation in Maya for her, their nickname for her was Big Fucker Woman. <laughs> Which she thought was hilarious. She loved that. <laughs> but she started this thing where uh, we would go down and teach the Maya what we learned, and they were actually so much better at it because they didn't have to pull out the stupid dictionaries. Once you taught them the syllabary, those were just words that made sense to them. So they picked it up very fast, and uh, it's continued to this day. Linda passed away now, I guess, geez, uh, 24 years ago. But we've continued this great association called MOM. It's a really appropriate thing because up in the highlands, they call the grandmother-grandfather spirits that float above us. They're generally called the MOM. Not MOM like your mom, but M-A-M. <laughs> And it works good because it's Maya for ancient Maya in English, but it's Maya Antiguo para los Mayas in Spanish. And so this is an association that I've been part of, a lot of people have, where every year we go down and we partner with the Maya to teach more Maya people how to translate their language. And it's been a very successful program, and I'm... I'm thrilled to be part of a moment in history like this. Has there ever been any moment where people have lost their written language for 500 years and then picked it back up? Now there are thousands of people that are down there in Guatemala, but also Honduras and Mexico, all doing their own seminars now. Uh, a couple years ago, there were enough, there were over a hundred of the teachers that were fully trained. I mean, they're better epigraphers than I am at this point. And, uh, and we tried to say, okay, you're free. Uh, you know, now you're doing it on your own. They were like, yeah, we are going to do it on our own. And we love that. But you guys should still send us money. <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay, that's cool. And, and really, uh, I, I contribute myself to it all the time because a lot of the people that go to these conferences, you know, they can go to the conference and spend a week there for like 200 bucks. And I can send somebody who goes back to their community and teaches everybody this. 
It's, it's a lot of times it's the, the elementary and high school level teachers who are doing this. And they're going back to their community and actually translating the histories in the uh, communities nearby. I'll tell you a little side story here that uh, one time Linda was in a little community in southern Yucatan uh, called Hormiguero. Uh, and there's a ruins called Hormiguero nearby, and she was going through the texts of that com particular community. And as she was going through and the titles of the king, she was translating for everybody, and a guy in the community, in the, in the audience, started to cry. And she said, hey, what's, what's going on with you? And he said, that's my last name, and I've been here for as long as I can remember. This is, I, my family's been here for generations. And I've walked in those ruins a hundred times and never realized my family name is on that monument. That was a pretty cool, powerful moment. It gives me chills just thinking about it. But that's the kind of thing that mom's doing. And really, I mean, at this point, it's not even mom. It's the Maya themselves. They have figured this out. And uh, here's a picture of one of those, those uh, sessions going on. Nowadays, it used to be at the start, it was people like me kind of, you know, with my terrible Spanish trying to teach people. Now, there's a whole crew of Maya people that are much better epigraphers than I. And it's an exciting thing to see. This is a great monument that's at the site of Ishim Che in Guatemala. Ishim Che was the capital of the Cachiquel people. And Pedro Alvarado burned it to the ground for Cortez in uh, the 1540s. And, uh, and then he used the Quiche against the Cachiquel and dominated the whole Maya civilization of the Guatemalan highlands there. But this is a monument that the local community at made in 2013. It's all beautiful hieroglyphs, just like the ones that are now archeological there. And it says that the city was burned in the 1540s by Pedro Alvarado and they did their best to wipe out the Maya and that people even said that the Maya said time was going to end in 2012, but that it's 2013 and that's not true and we're still here. <laughs> and so they wrote that whole thing in beautiful Maya hieroglyphs and it's up in front of the archeological site today and I think it's great. This is a, a small map of the various places. Now, that's actually outdated. There's more, there's a couple over here now in Chiapas that there are, there are Maya monuments of Stila written by Maya people going up all over the Maya world. For the first time in really over 500 years, the Maya have regained their language and they're, and they're writing in it. So uh, this is the organization, by the way, it's called discovermom.org. It's actually a nonprofit that's here in California. And uh, I hope that some of you check it out. I know that there's a lot of people in this community that are Maya by heritage or interested. And this is a real way that you can help the Maya regain what they've lost of their civilization and culture. So please check out discovermom.org and hopefully uh, You'll, you'll help them continue. Um, and as for me, if you'd like to know more about what I'm doing, the project I've been having the most fun with lately is this podcast I've been doing called Archeo Ed. So if you're into podcasts, please take a look at it. And uh, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you. Do I have time to entertain questions? Yes, if, if there are questions, we have mics. Uh, uh, I know it was very thorough, so don't, you know, if you don't have a question, that just means I didn't have a chat. <laughs> or that's how I'll question. interpret it. <laughs> what was the interest of the, of the Germans um, trying to decipher? What was the interest of the Germans trying to decipher the, the hieroglyphics in the Mayans? Oh, the early ones? Uh -huh. I think they were just trying to uh, understand civilization in general there. Mm -hmm. There was a, those, those looked like uh, artistic curiosities to them, I think, at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
uh, several years ago, I got a chance to read the Popol Vuh, and I was kind of surprised that, uh, kind of expected you to at least mention it. Did it figure into your work? Oh, absolutely. The Popol Vuh is a big thing, but actually that was part, uh, we at first assumed that the Popol Vuh was a mythological story uh, contemporaneous with the contact period. Like uh, the first, the, the written Popol Vuh we got, the, the first one in, in our alphabet was in the 1600s. So we did not know that it was going to go all the way back into the hieroglyphs. It was actually Michael Coe again in the 1970s who figured out that there were pots showing images of the Popol Vuh and then the hieroglyphs allowed us to translate like the hero twins names and we figured out that the Popol Vuh was actually thousands of years older than we thought. Now the oldest depictions are from the site of San Bartolo in Guatemala and they date back to like 200 BCE. So where we thought it was something from the 1600s Breaking the code allowed us to realize it was way older than that, and back to the origins of the Maya themselves. When was the call established? What time period? I had the opportunity to go there. Oh, <laughs> when was the call established? I had the opportunity to go there, and unfortunately, I didn't have an interpreter or, or any information. I was just wandering around. And I uh, was just curious of what time period that fell into. We have, uh, you know, ideas from archaeology and hieroglyphs. If we go from the hieroglyphic point of view, we don't have the name of the very first king, but we have a king that's like uh, the 11th in succession, and we backwards project average time periods mm -hmm. to go back to about 90 BCE, mm -hmm. would be the start of Tikal. And uh, archaeologically, we find some pottery that's also what we call pre-classic. That one will, has a, a wiggly line. It goes from like 250 BC to 250 AD. So definitely, you yeah, know, we'll, we'll, bar, we'll ballpark it at 2,000 years old. I'm excited to get the correct um, pronunciation of Stila. Yes, I would, Stila. I would call them Stellas. <laughs> <laughs> but I had the opportunity to it, see those. They're, they're very beautiful. Stila and Stile. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, that's, the, that's the plural, Stile. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I could be mispronouncing it. it Sheely was terrible about pronouncing things. I, I definitely, as <laughs> her student, what that is, what those are. <laughs> the, the, the monoliths that, that, that are carved, that's, those are Stila. I, could you speak uh, about Mayan conceptualization of consciousness and uh, how it's supposed to be changing in this time period, or is that true? Oh gosh, I don't know. I, from an archaeologist hieroglyphic perspective, I really think we can say very little. We know that there's a concept of ancestor uh, communication, so we know that they believe in an afterlife, that uh, the people that die go to either Shibalba underneath or up into the heavens. That was kind of the uh, legitimization of kings, that their spirits went up and they could act as liaisons to the god. But we know they believed in an afterlife. And, uh, you know, it's kind of hard to take modern Maya folks and uh, assume that it's how Maya a thousand years felt because they've had 500 years of acculturation and Christianization and everything's kind of a hybrid now. But if we look at uh, their concept of time, uh, that whole 2012 thing where it was supposed to be the prediction of the end of the world, that's not the way Maya think. We Westerners see time as a line going from the future to the past and the, and the present. They see it as a cycle. And so the contact period documents from Yucatan say again and again, what has happened before will happen again. And they looked at time as the, this this kind of wide circle of 
13 periods of 20 years, and each one of those had a different character. Some of them were going to be hard years of famine and, uh, and sickness. Some of them were going to be good, positive years of good governance and creative ideas. But they, they saw it as a cycle. So they, you know, spiritually they thought that things come around in a cyclical way and that if you harmonize with that cycle, you can brace yourself and be ahead of it instead of life affecting you you can step into it because you know what's going to happen next in a cyclical nature. Does that somewhat get at what you're asking? Yeah, I, uh, I've looked at uh, uh, Sorkin, a sociologist from Russia, and, and he, he has something very similar to, I think, Mayan conceptualization of time and the universe. And basically, he says that, uh, you know, we go through these cycles in Western civilization where we think, you know, reality is sensory oriented and then we think it's somehow spiritually oriented and uh, you know he thought that we were on the cusp of this uh, transformation and i was wondering if there was some type of parallel with the mayans i don't know whether the maya really uh thought in terms of transformation but they did they they would say things like uh a cycle is coming to an end and we're prepared for our change. On a Mesoamerican scale, not just the Maya, the Aztecs would do every 52 years, they'd have what they call the new fire ceremony, which was a 52 was a big juncture of their calendar. And they would burn down perfectly good temples and houses and rebuild them as a way to symbolically renew the world. So it wasn't so much, uh, a transformation like the kind of thing that the uh, the harmonic convergence was supposed to profess, but it was more uh, hitting the reset button. <laughs> and we have one more. We have a young scholar up here who has a question. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering if um, we're going to have a Mexico part of the Maya times. Was what Mexico part? Chihuahua. Uh, the Maya didn't live there, but Chihuahua was definitely part of, uh, of ancient history of Mexico. In fact, somewhere in Chihuahua might just be the mythical uh, origin spot for the Aztecs called Aslan. There's, there's some, some caves and uh, lakes there that very much fit what they're doing. There's also a, a wonderful ruins called Pakime in, uh, in Chihuahua. That's a, an incredible city. That's a, and that's a, that's a big part of, of, my, of Mexican history before Europe. So yeah, if you're from there, I've always wanted to go to Pakime. <laughs> 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 okay, well thank you.